Welcome to the Land Connection. Um, offshore wind and converter stations are coming. Um, I want to thank Attentive for their, their sponsorship of this panel. Um, I'm Joseph Sakali. I'm the Chief Waterfront Design Officer at Waterfront Alliance. Those who studied your, your program very intently will notice that I am not Anjali from the Sierra Club. Um, there were there were some some last minute um, challenges at Sierra Club that she's attending to, um, so I'm stepping in as the the moderator. All of the rest of the panelists are are I'll your your course. regular scheduled programming. <laughs> um, for those who are seeking ASLA and AIA CEUs um, and engineering PDHs, the information for those and the the sign up sheet is is at the station where you got your name tag this morning. Um, so I'm going to go quickly introduce our three panelists. Um, they each have a few a few slides that they'll they'll run through, um, and then we'll get into to some questions and save time for for Q and A at the end. So, um, you know, as as we all have been seeing, offshore wind has a lot of land components um, that allow the electricity that's generated offshore to be brought into the existing grid and then then to our, our homes and offices. Converter stations and, and um, in water and overland cables are coming. Um, so this panel is really intended to explore what the, the impact is, how that's, how that's showing up in communities, and then what some of the community benefits of, of this infrastructure can be. Um, so our, our first panelist is going to be um, Liz Grizzaro, she's a lawyer who's worked in energy and environmental protection since 1992 when she joined the New York Attorney General um, Environmental Protection Bureau. She's worked in public and private sector uh, practice over your career. She's a policy advisor to the chair of the Public Service Commission, uh, and a lot of her recent work is focused on the zero emission econo economy plan that's part of the, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. We also have, and I think I have everyone's picture here, some of the pictures here. Um, we have Sarah uh, Doherty, who's the Community Engagement Manager at Invenergy Leading Light Offshore Wind. She's worked in climate and sustainability for more than a, a decade in, in a few different roles. She's worked for CARP Strategies. She's worked for Waterfront Alliance. She was one of the, the previous leaders of the WEDGE program, um, has a master's in regional planning from Cornell. And then finally, we have um, Roberta Zoyer, who is the VP of Environmental Management at Rise Light and Power. She's responsible for managing environmental permitting um, and compliance for development projects and existing assets. Um, she's been permitting large-scale energy projects for about 15 years. Um, to start us off, um, and Liz, why don't we have you go first, could you provide kind of a general land or general overview of the landscape of offshore wind projects in our area um, and why we need them okay so <laughs> thank you and thank you for the invitation and that lovely introduction um, I think uh, you, you mentioned community benefits and I and I smiled to myself because actually from my perspective at the Department of Public Service one of the primary community benefits of offshore wind is keeping the lights on in New York City uh, we know, based on the studies that we've been doing around electrification and climate uh, targets, that uh, New York City's electric demand is going to grow enormously over the coming decades, and offshore wind is a major and important component in satisfying the energy demand of the city. So that's, when you're talking about community benefits, we think that's a big one. Um, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about my, my agency, which is the Public Service Commission. Most people don't have any need to know what we do, but we do some things that are going on behind the scenes that are pretty important. Uh, the primary thing we do is we regulate all of the state's electric and gas utilities. That means we, uh, we set the rates that ratepayers pay for their services, and we review and approve all of their capital plans and investment plans. So we are in charge of making sure that the electric and gas infrastructure is there and that the lights go on when you need them and that the service is safe and reliable. So in, as part of doing that, one of, the, one of our functions is to oversee the planning for both electric and gas transmission, but we'll be talking here about electric. 
and for several decades now, we have, uh, in, in parallel, in uh, partnership with utilities, uh, been planning to meet your service as well as public policy needs uh, through the through electric infrastructure. So that's what we do. Um, in talking about offshore wind and in talking about transmission, which are uh, our main topics today, I like to show this slide, which I stole from the New York Independent System Operator um, to give you uh, some idea of the task that we are facing not only here in New York City, but across the state. On the left-hand side, you have this nice little illustration that shows you some uh, different generating, generating plants, including there's a, there's a wind turbine there. It might be offshore, I don't know, but there's a wind turbine. Uh, and on the right-hand side, on the far right, you have representations of some of the users, some of the customers uh, who depend on the energy generated by those electric generating plants. Everything in between is one or another component of the transmission system that brings the energy from those different generating sources to the loads, the demands, that's all of you. Uh, and there are a bunch of components to it. We'll be talking about some of them. We may be talking about some of them today. Uh, but the, the point I like to make uh, with people in looking at this little graphic is uh, we, are, we are changing that left-hand side of the picture, and we are simultaneously changing the right-hand side of that picture. And what do I mean? We're taking out the fossil fuel producers on the left-hand side and replacing them with something else. And on the right-hand side, we are electrifying parts of the economy that have not been electrified before, including transportation. So we are changing the sources of the energy and we are changing the demand for the energy. And you can probably conclude that the stuff in the middle has to change to accommodate what's happening on both ends. And that's what we do. We are, we are engaged in long-term planning to make sure as we transition our energy sources and as we electrify the economy, the transmission system is adequate to continue serving you and New York's economy. So offshore wind, um, the commission has a big role in the offshore wind program. We are the, the uh, agency that authorizes NYSERDA to run the procurements that you're probably familiar with. We have given them permission to procure up to nine gigawatts of offshore uh, generating plants. And to date, what you've seen in, in the responses to those NYSERDA procurements has been a model that I call the radial model. Where, you, where the developer builds an offshore generating platform and also is responsible for building uh, his or her uh, connecting line uh, to the mainland grid. We call that the radial model. And that's been, that's been, as I said, the paradigm to date. And we have a couple of projects that are you know, proceeding under that paradigm. However, uh, that's not a very efficient paradigm from uh, our point of view. So, so the commission recently changed the paradigm for planning and constructing offshore wind transmission to one where we have more of a highway approach. We are going to uh, find transmission developers who can build transmission pathways that will serve more than one generating platform. Uh, and we're doing this in part because uh, having one, one cable route that's responsible for a lot of energy uh, involves less community disruption less environmental impact, and lower cost to ratepayers. So instead of having each individual wind farm with its own connecting line, the wind farms will connect to the transmission facility, and the transmission facility, the single transmission facility, will bring the, the energy generated by all of those wind farms to its landing points onshore. So there'll just be one set of shoreside um, facilities rather than multiple shoreside facilities, which is what you would have under the radial model. So again, trying to minimize community impact, trying to minimize environmental disruption. So currently, um, we have out kind of on the street uh, what a solicitation for transmission proposals on this, on this paradigm, uh, capable of carrying between 4.7 and 8 gigawatts of energy um, from offshore points. Uh, and we want this uh, transmission facility to collect that energy and deliver it uh, to interconnection points on the Con Edison system. We have specified that those that this project, this big infrastructure project, should be in service by 2033, um, and the uh, uh, transmission developer proposals are due on June 4th, next month, uh, and will undergo an intensive evaluation by our partners, the New York Independent System Operator, 
who will rank all of the proposals and sort of select one uh, that appears to be the most cost, cost efficient, cost effective of all the competing proposals submitted. And at that point, we will know, you will know, um, which transmission developer's design uh, has turned out to be the most efficient one from a system perspective, and you will know where it's landing, where the cables are going, um, what facilities are going to be needed on the land side, uh, all of that will be available, and that project will then undergo uh, a very complicated but not unfamiliar process to obtain its permits for construction and operation. So I, 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 I talk about this, it's a little bit weedy, but I want people to understand there's a big change underway here. We are shifting from project by project interconnections to a single set of, a, a single landing point, uh, a single transmission facility to serve multiple generating platforms. And the basic reason is less impact. Um, that's my very brief presentation and look forward to your questions very much. Sarah, do you want to go next? Sure. It's a rare day when I don't have to move this down. Short person problems. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Doherty. I'm the Community Engagement Manager for the Leading Light Wind Project with Invenergy. I will also try to keep this quick. Um, Luckily, Liz covered a lot of what I was going to share. Um, <laughs> so Leading Light Wind is an American-led offshore wind project um, that is bringing renewable energy to the state of New Jersey. We're a joint venture between Invenergy and Energy Re. We were recently given um, the largest competitively awarded offshore wind contract uh, in the U.S. to date, which we're super excited about. Um, so we're generating, or we have a contract to generate over 2,400 megawatts of renewable energy, which is enough to power a million New Jersey homes, um, offset about 4 million tons of carbon emissions annually, and also deliver over $3 billion of economic benefits um, and $150 million community benefits program, which I'm a big part of and am really excited about. So I think one of the common um, misconceptions out there is that the offshore wind process is very brief. It is not, I assure you. Um, I've only been with the company for a year, but there's been a lot in the works for a long time. Um, this is sort of where we are today, moving forward. Um, we've been in develop the planning and development process, trying to get all of our permits, doing a lot of stakeholder engagement to submit our construction and operations plan, which we need to get approved before we can actually start construction. Construction will start around 2028, um, and then will be operational by 2031. So we're really excited to be American-led, and with that comes a um, really strong commitment to investing in our local economy. So when we say we're delivering over $3 billion of economic benefits, what does that mean? It means investing in the local supply chain, whether it's um, tier, we call them tier one, tier two, tier three companies, um, trying to get more, more minority, small veteran owned businesses into the mix. Um, this is a new industry in the US. It's not new in the world, um, but we need to get a lot of these companies to see their place in the supply chains. So we're doing a lot of offshore or a lot of outreach around that. Um, we're investing in new infrastructure, new O&M ports, New Jersey's wind port, um, and also um, working with different community groups and partners. And with all of this uh, comes about 7,500 jobs that are aligned with um, the major uh, labor unions. So our community benefits program, this is something that I talk a lot about, and I encourage you if you're uh, community organizer out there and you have questions about this, this is really the mechanism for delivering um, the benefits of, in, in a large way, the benefits of offshore winds to communities. Um, our community benefits program is structured around three things. The first that we're excited about um, is new with our project is an energy equity credit that is um, uh, providing direct assistance to over 200,000 energy burdened households across New Jersey. Um, part of our commitment to overburden communities across the state. Uh, we have a commitment of 24 million to the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection um, to study the ongoing uh, impacts of offshore wind. 
And also um, a lot of funding towards community partnerships. So we're continuing to support the groups that are already doing a lot of the good work around um, economic development, environmental research, and workforce development. So this is like the, I guess, the principles of what we're doing, and then I hope we can get into more of the tactics of what good community engagement looks like, because transmission development and offshore wind, as I mentioned, it's a new industry, so there are a lot of um, challenges that are much the same for development projects, but a lot that are really unique to the industry. Um, and so for our project, we like to abide by these three principles. Um, you can see them on the screen, so I'll just say that when it comes to humility, we know that <coughs> our industry and offshore wind would not be here today if it weren't for the decades of advocacy that EJ groups and labor unions have been doing to advocate for a just transition. And so we want to build on that work. And so our role is really just to show up and to be present. So we've attended over 400 events um, in the last year a lot of time on the New Jersey Turnpike, just going to different conferences, meeting with different community groups, um, teaching the basics of offshore wind and different workforce opportunities to um, classrooms. There's so many amazing teachers out there that are really connecting the dots on um, renewable energy and climate change as a way to train their students in STEM skills, um, to prepare them for these opportunities that will be coming online. Uh, I mentioned construction starts in 2028. So there's a lot of workforce jobs that will be available to our bright young scholars. Um, so we're really committed to that. I think Liz already touched on this, but I just wanted to say that the state of New Jersey and New York have been policy leaders in minimizing um, the impacts of this transmission development by merging the, the infrastructure. So in New Jersey, we call it, we love an acronym, so it's this shared agreement approach. Um, so our project will be sharing a um, transmission line with other developers to get to the Larrabee Tri, tri Collector Station. Big mouthful there. Um, and then I think we'll get into the meat of this, but I just wanted to say here that the strategy, I guess, bullets in bold are what we aim to do. I think as urban planners, community engagement people, we know that these are the goals, but then the actual tactics and what works, I think we're... We're constantly trying to learn for ourselves, um, but those are the, the sub-bullets. Um, and I can get into more of that, I think, after this. But yeah, thanks. Oh, and feel free to reach out. I'd love to chat with you after. I think, okay, I think that's good. Okay, so hi, I'm Roberta Zweier. I am the VP of Environmental Management at Rise Light and Power. And today I'm gonna share with you a little bit about the role that offshore wind plays in our vision to transform Ravenswood Generating Station into a renewable energy hub. So Rise is a energy transition company, but we also own and operate the largest power plant in New York City. Ravenswood Generating Station provides about 20% of the electricity to New York City. We are situated uniquely on 27 acres of waterfront in Long Island City, Queens, mm -hmm. and we proudly employ um, about 100 uh, union workers that are part of the Utility Workers of America, Local 1 and 2. Together, um, these folks have been working to keep the lights on for New York City for over 60 years. So just a little bit more about Ravenswood. Um, like I said, we are situated on uh, 27 acres in Long Island City, Queens. We have three 1960s era um, fossil fuel generating units. Those are units 10, 20, and 30. And then a state of the art um, combined cycle unit, that's unit 40. And then in that um, red box that you see um, to the left of your screen, um, is the site of a retired peaker plant. So in that footprint, there are 16 retired, uh, no longer operating simple cycle gas peaker units. And um, that presents a wonderful opportunity for us and for the city um, for redevelopment, which I'll get into here in a minute. Um, and so in 2022, uh, RISE and Ravenswood launched our renewable Ravenswood plan. And that is our plan to retire 
our existing um, fossil, uh, 1960s era fossil generators um, by bringing in renewable energy into Ravenswood. So the first pillar of the Renewable Ravenswood plan is um, bringing <coughs> offshore wind from the New York Bight. Um, the second pillar is the ability to bring um, uh, wind and solar generated upstate uh, through cables and interconnection at Ravenswood. And then our third pillar is to provide for battery storage at times when the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow. And then finally, um, we have a large um, water withdrawal permit that is used for once, once through cooling for the um, steam turbine generators. And um, we have a vision to repurpose that um, existing once through cooling system to develop a district thermal energy network that would allow for um, heating and cooling of nearby buildings within the, the Queens area. Um, a little bit about our community around, around Ravenswood. We are um, within two miles of 7,500 public housing units. Um, we have been engaging with these local communities over, you know, in the recent years to really um, work with them to understand what they see their needs and for um, a redevelopment of Ravenswood. Um, we've engaged in local community forums, um, you know, keeping NYCHA residents really at the forefront of our engagement um, and really hearing from them what they want, which includes, um, you know, job training and opportunities for folks um, as, as time goes on. Um, we've, you know, briefed elected, elected officials around our um, plans for Ravenswood and provide regular um, updates to the NYCHA, NYCHA residents associations and um, probably one of the, uh, ver among the exciting things that have happened over the last uh, year at Ravenswood, we are fortunate to have Secretary Jennifer Granholm come visit um, last, last year. And so um, just moving on to offshore wind, um, it's offshore wind that is really the, the first uh, opportunity to make our Ravenswood, uh, Renewable Ravenswood um, vision a reality and our partnership in the Attentive Energy One project. So that would again bring, uh, bring uh, offshore wind generate energy up through the Narrows and into Ravenswood. And then I know we'll get into this a little bit more later, but there's the onshore connections that are needed and um, the conditioning of the electricity so it can go into the electric grid the picture up on the right just gives you an idea of what um, a converter station may look like. And, um, and then the bottom just kind of, again, gives you the idea of elevation-wise what it looks like compared to the existing um, infrastructure that is at Ravenswood. Um, it's big, but big change takes big things, and we're excited about the big things to come at Ravenswood. All right, so I, I think this, I'll direct this first question to Liz. Okay. Um, you, you've talked a little bit about kind of why we need to focus on the grid connections, the, the, the two sides of that, that image that you showed. Yeah. Is our transi uh, transmission grid ready for the influx of energy? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> Explain that. Okay. <laughs> so um, when, can you go back to your picture, the picture before that? Because that was kind of a hand in the, how do I go back? Can I go backwards? I think it's the red there button. There we go, the red button. Does it go backwards? Um, this one. Uh, so just pretend that that green, you know, that that green thing is a big cable bringing energy into um, New York City. Um, you, you can't uh, land five, six, eight gigawatts of energy into Con Edison uh, without impacting the land side system. So, um, but we are going to make sure in, in selecting a project here and in, in, um, and in the siting and funding of the project, we are going to include requirements that those um, land side upgrades uh, be explored and that there be plans for those. Excuse me. Um, so it'll be, it'll be a, an integral uh, part of the project to define what are the um, land side needs um, and make sure that those are constructed uh, in tandem with the offshore cable. Uh, others are, are welcome to jump in on that or I can move to the, the next question which is really around you know, building on that. W what infrastructure up 
must be upgraded and what needs to be completely new. And maybe Sarah, if you could take the land side and Roberta, if you could take the water side of that. Um, sure, so I will bring my, well, it's pretty far back there. Um, <laughs> this back to this um, diagram I, it's not not perfect but basically um, from the landfall site which is that blue square um, to the converter station um, the big box on the left um, all of that w is what in New Jersey we're calling the PBI or the pre-build infrastructure and so everything there has to be um, or is new so the way New Jersey is doing it they currently um, they received bids for the solicitation for the PBI de developer. So whoever they choose to actually develop the, the transmission lines will essentially dig a hole between um, where the land falls. <laughs> I, I, I'm not an engineer, so I, this is how it <laughs> sticks in my head. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so the, the landfall site has been predetermined by us by the BPU um, in Monmouth County, uh, which is the blue square, and then the developer builds the tram transmission line from landfall to the converter station. At that point, uh, Leading Light Winds and several other developers will need to lay their cable from landfall to the converter station um, and prepare the converter station. Um, it's developed, it's made ready by another developer and then uh, we, the other developers, have to um, make upgrades for our specific projects. And the, the water and side? From the water side, so I will go back <laughs> to my slide, <laughs> sorry. Well, um, but generally speaking, you know, there is new infrastructure that is needed from the wind farm to the point of interconnection where the cables make landfall. Um, so, and then uh, maybe just building on what Sarah said, the at the at the landfall site, um, the the power that's at least going into New York, um, and that we're proposing um, will come in as HVDC. Um, and again, I'm not an engineer, and I'm really not an electrical engineer, but um, you are able to transmit more electricity from um, offshore in a smaller or in fewer cables if you use an HVDC cable as opposed to um, an AC cable. And so once it gets back on shore, then the power needs to be converted back to AC power so it can go into the grid. And so that's the reason for um, the, the larger converter station that you see at Ravenswood. There's the converter equipment that's in there, um, and then there will also be substations that kind of step down the power and allow it to go into the grid. Um, and then uh, for our project at Ravenswood, we're also planning for an operation and maintenance hub that will provide for, um, again, operations and maintenance related to the wind farm and related to um, the cables that are running through the harbor and then also port facilities that would allow for um, service operations vessels that are servicing the wind farms to, to come in and out. And then we also have a training center planned for our facility as well. If I could add one thing, it pr pr probably goes without saying, but the converter station and some of these other landside facilities, they're not unique to electrons coming from a offshore wind farm. <laughs> you would have to have this equipment, you know, whenever you were injecting that much energy into, uh, into the existing grid, whatever the source of that energy, uh, it's not a particular uh, attribute of offshore wind that you have to do these things. These are things you have to do as a matter of uh, building and maintaining the electrical system. And Liz, when you're thinking about these, the, the long distance overland cable line, um, what are the factors that go into determining the route? Long, the, the overland cable Over, line? Overland, yes. Okay, so um, <laughs> we, we have a lot, everybody knows, we have a lot of existing upland transmission infrastructure um, and the, the routes, uh, when, when, when we have to do upgrades to those parts of the system, we generally have a pretty good idea where the stuff is. Um, we also have a, a commission policy that favors the reuse of existing rights of way. So when we're talking about upland uh, transmission system upgrades, we're usually talking about something that at least is grounded or focused on existing rights of way. Um, and so the 
utility, it's almost always the utility, the owner of the facilities, the utility will come in and say, we want to, you know, we want to work on this line, and we all know where that is. Um, and the route is sort of, it's predetermined because it's exi existing, an existing facility. Uh, that's, you know, sort of the majority of the work that we do. When, when you need to go what we call greenfield, when you need to develop an upland um, uh, transmission facility uh, uh, in uh, over some area that has not been previously disturbed, where you don't have existing utility rights away, uh, then you have to come into the siting process with a more complex and more robust um, uh, justification for the particular route that you might be selecting, including uh, assessment of the various environmental impacts. Um, so that would get worked out uh, between the proposer, the developer of the facility, and uh, our staff, our agency, and the um, experts involved in the siting process. So, so two follow-ups on that, one for you and then one for Sarah. Um, so first, how flexible, for the Greenfield um, ones in particular, how flexible is the routing actually? Um, that's a hard question to answer uh, because we consider ourselves pretty flexible within uh, within a certain envelope. Mm -hmm. um, we have to meet uh, environmental standards for uh, uh, identification and mitigation of, of impacts, all sorts of impacts. So we we have to we have to meet those standards. The, the proposal has to you know weigh and balance and and check all those boxes. Um, and we also have to overlay with that. Okay, is this route cost effective? Is it is it a reasonable cost to the ratepayer to pick this route as opposed to something else? So it's a very complicated balancing to make sure that we have selected a route that represents sort of the the best compromise among the possible impacts, uh, while also being cost effective. And then Sarah, what does community support or concern look like for these routing discussions? Yes. So um, I think. You all read the news. Uh, I think anytime there's change, there is um, people have a lot of questions, and change is hard for many people. So the larger conversation about offshore wind, uh, especially in New Jersey, where there's so many homeowners, um, and you know, I think the Waterfront Alliance is a great place to have this conversation because people's connections to the water go back to the beginning of time. Like it's a very personal thing to be on the water. So all this is to say, um, development for the specific industry is tough and we want to make sure that we're doing it well. Um, it's a balance, I think, especially since there are so many uh, players in the sandbox, as we're saying, with the PBI. Um, we want to make sure that we're first really, really coordinated with the other developers and our friends at state agencies um, so that we have a unified approach to how we're working together and messaging things to the public. Um, we actually just got our industry association, NJOA, um, led by Paulina O'Connor, she might be here. It's really incredible. Um, there's a lot of leadership for just, you know, how, how we come together as an industry on that. Um, and then just, I guess, at a smaller local level, we want to make sure that we're reaching out to key stakeholders first. A lot of um, commissioners, local electeds, council members. Um, to see what works best in their communities. And then over time, um, sort of a mix of fun, family-friendly, you know, here's what offshore wind is, renewable energy, I'm a climate champion um, type events, and then more listening sessions, office hours, Atlantic Shores, which has um, been a real leader, is the first project to be working in uh, New Jersey, has been doing a lot of great um, community events and just fielding questions and going through this before everyone else. Um, so. Yeah, talk to them, ask them the tough questions. <laughs> Speaking of asking tough questions, I'd love to turn it over to the audience to ask you guys tough questions. Um, so uh, um, Alexi's got a, a microphone um, that she'll pass around. I'd love to hear what you guys want to know. Yeah, um, so a question on electricity rates for homeowners. So um, I'm from both New York and New Jersey, and there's perhaps misinformation or true information about electricity bills going up with the use of um, offshore wind. So I just wanted to kind of get clarification on, since these projects require a significant investment of taxpayer dollars, and it is a long-term project, how do you see the kind of uh, 
trend in electricity rates going up or down you know, as the projects are getting implemented? That's an excellent question. Um, and I'll, I'll try to answer it from, you know, from the regulator perspective. <sighs> no doubt it costs money. Uh, in fact, when I look at transmission, uh, at the transmission system and at our climate targets, I often say to my, we often say, you know, we, we have to charge the ratepayer both to maintain the system we have today, while we also somehow figure out how to fund the infrastructure that we know we're going to need um, in a different energy world. Um, and that's a, that's a heavy road to hoe. And, and my commissioners worry about it a lot. Uh, in fact, we, uh, we got some you know, mixed press when we turned down a request from some of the wind developers who were seeking more money due to various factors, and we said no. It's not, not in the ratepayer interest to do that. Uh, so my, my commissioners are very, very aware of those cost issues. That's why I keep saying we need a cost-effective <laughs> solution. Um, it's part of our DNA. It's in our mission. Um, that said, we have a huge mountain to climb, you know, to sort of accomplish this transition. But, y you know, one of the, th there are other economic factors that we expect to be in play for the long term. Uh, one of them is, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're reducing the cost of fuel. And fuel cost has been a huge driver of your electric bills for all of our industrial history, um, you know, in, in the future world, I'm not quite sure how this is going to play out, but it, we're contemplating a future world in which the fuel is essentially free. So that comes out of, comes out of your bill. I can't tell you when, <laughs> in theory. <laughs> um, but there is no doubt that we are facing a very, we have to climb a very tall mountain to put this new infrastructure in place. Um, and uh, we at the, at the department and the Public Service Commission are focused on that every day. I'm just going to add a quick, quick tidbit. Um, I don't think I'm going to get this, this right, but uh, this, the shared approach in New Jersey is estimated to save $900 million to rate payers. So I think there is a lot of policy innovation on how to streamline, <coughs> minimize impacts, reduce rates. And the other thing I want to say is that um, pricing in offshore wind is a really big challenge. Uh, OREC pricing, the price per kilowatt hour, we have to determine that price in order to bid. So that's, that, that's very, very challenging with inflation and just all the uncertainties out there. But it's actually in our order, a public document that lives online, how much the average annual increase is. I think it's around $3 for our project. Um, and so we're trying to um, adjust for that with the energy equity credit, but um, it, is, it is a challenge for sure. <coughs> Other questions from the audience? Good afternoon. Um, I think the effort, uh, Liz, that you are undertaking to consolidate the entry points uh, to land are really logical and laudable. I was curious how that is balanced with the um, ability to ensure resilience, you know, in the event of um, a terrorist attack, you know, or just having single interconnection points. Um, is how do you, how is that balanced? Or is that not a concern um, as far as a, you know, something that could be, yeah, I think the existing system is cumbersome, but it, it offers a lot of resilience and there's many connection points. Uh, is that a concern or maybe I'm just. Um, terrorists watch, watch in too particular? Many, no, 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 <laughs> not terrorism, but uh, any kind of a subsea cable uh, is. No, we, ac we, actually th we actually think that, um, well, we design infrastructure, you know, in partnership with the utilities and, and sometimes independent infrastructure developers. And, and we've learned a lot of lessons. Con Edison has learned a lot of lessons. We design infrastructure for in different levels of resiliency than we used to. Um, so that will go into the design of this project. Um, no, no doubt about that. I can't tell you the specifics because I'm not an expert in resiliency engineering or, or rates or anything else, really. But, um, but, but, but we, we, we that will s there will be some designed in uh, resiliency. Um, uh, what was your other question? It was kind of. Oh my! I, I think you you you've answered it. Um, maybe it was a fantastical uh, example, but um, thank you. I appreciate it. That okay. Was okay. <laughs>
think I saw a question from Fred in the back. Hi, thank you for all that you've uh, presented. I had a question. Um, fairly recently, New York State has produced an expedited process for environmental review and permitting. And uh, it is a fairly new process. So I'm wondering, will that be of assistance to you guys, um, given the fact it is fairly new and relatively untried? Well, thanks for noting that. And um, uh, well, it's not in effect yet. Uh, the first task under that new statute, which we call the RAPID Act, uh, is for uh, the agency to uh, establish, you know, basically establish the permitting regime. And once the permitting regime is in place, uh, then you know, new applications for transmission facilities will be processed under it. Um, until that happens, uh, we have an existing uh, transmission siting statute that we lovingly referred to as Article 7. Uh, and <laughs> and Article 7 remains in effect. Uh, there are, you know, we have, I was talking to staff earl earlier this morning, we have lots and lots of applications in the queue today uh, for transmission facilities and upgrades under Article 7, uh, and those will continue. So, um, so TBD, it'll be about a year from now before those new regulations are ready. And I guess maybe I would just add to that, um, we have projects that are going through the Article 7 process right now. It's a very, there is a very rigorous environmental review process that is part of that. Um, you know, in terms of the existing ORES process for um, <coughs> uh, new generation, that also has a very rigorous environmental review process. And my expectation that is that the new process for transmission siting would be uh, similar as well. My nightmare is the <laughs> <laughs> my nightmare is the first project we have to permit under the new regulations will be the offshore wind transmission. <laughs> <laughs> we should probably talk. <laughs> Another question in the back. Well, we'll have you wait for the mic just because we're recording the session. Hi. Given offshore wind, wind could be potentially more unstable than a fossil fuel uh, power plant. How is the converter station adapted to that, and what's the future for offsetting those imbalances in the energy supply? So, so we don't see the converter station as being particularly relevant to that question. I mean, the converter station is there to 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 uh, what, what did you say? Recondition the energy so that it can be injected into the distribution grid here in in New York City, um, but. Uh, uh, we are very aware um, that the, um, you know, that there are all kinds of plans to uh, reduce New York City's dependence on fossil fuel sources, uh, which there, which means we have to increase dependence on other kinds of sources, which come with different operating characteristics than the kinds of um, kinds of resources we're used to managing. Uh, so we, we study those issues um, and uh, we think we have, in general, we, we think we have uh, pathways to achieving a, a stable and reliable New York City system, but there are still some big questions hanging out there uh, and some of the details. Um, so I think that's about all I can say about that. I'll just add, too, that um, offshore wind is a really uh, incredible source for a number of reasons, but um, about 80% of the country lives in coastal cities. Um, so when you think about locally sourced sources, uh, offshore wind is close to a lot of those uh, population epicenters. Um, and then also the technology is changing. So the wind, the, the environment is, there's a lot more consistency to offshore as opposed to onshore wind. Also bigger turbines, um, which allows us to capture more of that. Um, I am not one of the physicists and engineers that works on that, but um, Casey on our team does, and we all bother her at all times because it's really fascinating stuff. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question before we break, right in here in the front. Hi, um, I'm a student, and I actually recently learned about like wind turbines, and I'm just curious because um, I know that they have about a lifespan of around 25 years and like the most volatile areas and you have to place them there because they get the most consistent energy. Um, and I'm just curious, like what are the efforts that um, you guys are taking to deal with the turbines when they're, when the lifespan is ended? I've seen that they usually like are so 
big and the cheapest way to get rid of them is to bury them and I'm just curious about like some of the waste that's being created by these efforts and how they're being offset. Gee, I'm not sure any of us has quite the right expertise to answer that question, but um, you know, uh, the disposal or recycling of you know the materials involved in in constructing the turbines is kind of something that I, I know folks are thinking about and working on. Um, I don't know that anyone has pointed to any particular method as being the you know the best way or the right way to do it. Um, Sure, we have to account for the life cycle of the asset, um, and and um, we have to, you know, we the options for what to do with the turbine when it reaches its life. I think are are there are several, but I'm not sure that anybody is you know fully settled on like what's you know what's the best solution overall. Um, you know, we're still fairly new. I I I um I was developing wind projects in upstate New York in the early 2000s, and those projects. Just hit their 20-year mark, and they were um, repowered. I was very proud of the team <laughs> because they basically, you know, you can you can build a better, a more modern uh, turbine on top of the one that you used to have, um, which is a great, you know, which is a good thing. You don't have to create any more disruption to the environment. You can just get more energy out of the same location. Um, so that's the upside. That you want to keep keep the facility running. You, you repower it. You have to do something with the uh, old facility. Um, but uh, I don't think the solution is simply to bury them. I'd be surprised. Just add quickly that it is a really interesting emerging field, and um, one of the partnerships that my colleague Jeff in the crowd, you can ask him about later, um, uh, is we're, we're creating a, a grant program for different uh, colleges and universities throughout New Jersey to study uh, material science. Um, so different PhDs and smart scholars out there can and can apply um, for grant funding to study how we we use these materials over time. Okay, we may develop new materials. Or Our yes, <laughs> they'll get very rich. All right, so that concludes the the session. Um, I want to thank our panelists for for being up here. Give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. We have a break for about 10 minutes until 3.05, which is when the next session will start. Um, in this room, we'll be delivering climate resilience infrastructure at a faster pace with better results, um, which is, seems like a really wow. tall order. I better go. Everyone <laughs> should join that one. Um, or come see me for the next offshore wind panel downstairs, ports and, ports and resilience in the main hall. There are others too, but those two seem like the best ones. Uh, <laughs> Uh, if, if you need the AIA or ASLA or engineering PDHs, check in at the, the table downstairs where you got your name tag. Otherwise, thank you all for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet 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 you. N